Good morning and uh, welcome to Bible Baptist Church and uh, welcome to this time when we are going to reflect upon God's Word together. I trust that uh, you have your Bible still open to uh, Exodus uh, chapter 6, Exodus chapter 7. John Maxwell uh, tells a story about two cows that were grazing in a pasture field. They looked up from there chewing on the grass and there was a milk truck that was uh, driving down that country road. On the side of the milk truck were these words, homogenized, pasteurized, vitamin A added. One of the cows looked at the other one and said, reading something like that makes you feel really inadequate, doesn't it? <laughs> I don't know what makes a cow feel inadequate, but I know there are a lot of people in our world who feel inadequate. Parents feel inadequate. They're raising children, some of you are grandparents, and you help out with that whole process, and you think about what is before you, and you might say, I, I feel inadequate for this task. How am I gonna raise these children? New employees sometimes, when they uh, join a company staff, and they have responsibilities that are placed upon them, and then more responsibilities and more responsibilities, sometimes they will say, I'm not sure I can do all of this. They, feel inadequate in terms of what they're going to do. And then those of us who identify with the cause of Christ and we say that we are Christ followers, we come to a church, we come to a small group, and we know that the scriptures teach us different things that we are supposed to do. We sometimes say commands that are given to us. We've looked at one of these commands a couple of weeks ago, and you will remember that we were told that we were to make disciples of all nations. And when you think about that task, and when you think about your own role in that task, you might say, not me, I am inadequate for the things that I am supposed to do. Or what about the fact that when Jesus himself says to believers that they are to lay up treasures in heaven where moth and rust doesn't consume and those things aren't necessarily taken away from us. What Jesus was really advocating was using money to invest in people so that those people in this life, that they would be, enri uh, uh, they would be enriched for the life to come. Uh, we are told in so many ways that we are to be generous. So we are to make disciples, we are to be generous. Well, here's one. It seems so simple when we first hear it, but it's this whole responsibility that we are to love one another even as Jesus has loved us. Now I like that whole command to love other people when they're people like me. They like the things that I like. They enjoy doing the things that I enjoy doing. They agree with the ideas that I have. But what about people who are not necessarily on the same page with us? It's difficult, let's be honest, to love those kinds of people. And yet that's one of the commands that God has given to us. And we feel inadequate in terms of what God asks us to do. How are we supposed to deal with the inadequacies of, of life when God himself calls us to his cause and calls us to do certain things that we read in the scripture? I'm going to suggest to you this morning that this passage that was read for us just a, a moment ago is going to give us some insight in terms of of how we handle this feeling of inadequacy. So with your Bibles open, I want us to take a look at this text in terms of, of what it's teaching. I want us to look at the passage and its context. On the other side of that, I'm going to introduce to you a principle that I trust you will take with you into life, and then we'll talk about how is it that we might practice this principle in some very real ways. So that's where we're headed. Let's look at the passage and its context. We haven't been in Exodus for a couple of weeks, but would you uh, make note of the fact that back in Exodus chapter 3, the call of God came to Moses. God met with Moses in the land of Midian. Moses was taking care of his father-in-law's sheep, and you remember how all of that went. He saw a burning bush, and out of the burning bush came this call of God in which God says, 
Moses, this is what I want you to do. I want you to go back down into Egypt and deliver my people right there, right away. Moses was beginning to feel inadequate, and he was saying, send somebody else. And then in chapter 4, that whole calling upon Moses uh, continues. He's told what he's going to do. He's even uh, given some signs that he is to present to the elders of Israel and then ultimately to Pharaoh. He's still a little bit reluctant, and then he finally goes back, and in chapter 5, you may remember, uh, Moses and the elders of Israel go to Pharaoh, let my people go, and you may remember what happened at that point. Pharaoh made life miserable for the children of Israel. <clears throat> then we get to chapter 6. Uh, there's this uh, sense in which Moses is told he can go back because God is going to be with him, and God begins to reveal that he is truly the Lord. Then there's a, a short segment at the end of chapter 6 in which there is a genealogy that is stated, and we ask ourselves, we can hardly pronounce any of these names. Why is it that God has placed this genealogy in, in the uh, passage that's talking about the deliverance of the people of Israel? A lot of speculation about that. I'd like to suggest to you uh, one possibility, the conclusion that I've come to, and that is, Remember that, that Moses hasn't been around the people of Israel for a long period of time. They have been in bondage for 400 years, and then Moses shows up and says, God's going to deliver you. And people could say, who is this guy? Why is he here? Is he really one of us? Moses is placed in that genealogy to show the people of Israel and to show a later generation of the people of Israel that he is truly a Hebrew. Hebrew. He may have been raised in the land of Egypt. He may have spent a lot of time in, uh, uh, in Midian, but he is one of the Hebrews. He is like us. So there's demonstration as to who he is. And then I want you to notice at the end of Hebrews chapter uh, 6, and Dennis read this for us, that the call on Moses is given again. We, we see this in verse 28. On the day when the Lord spoke to Moses in the land of Egypt, the Lord said to Moses, I am the Lord. That should have been sufficient enough right there. I am the Lord. Tell Pharaoh, king of Egypt, all that I say to you. But Moses said to the Lord, Behold, I am of uncircumcised lips. How will Pharaoh listen to me? Now the big question, the big debate is, what did he mean when he said, I am one of uncircumcised lips. What does that possibly mean? A lot of people have come to the conclusion that Moses was a stutterer. He had difficulty speaking, and so therefore he said, Don't, I, I'm not going to be capable of doing this. Please send someone else. I'm not convinced that that was really the problem that Moses had. Had a lot of fear in his life. We've already seen that along the way. I think there's something else that is going on. Moses, you may remember, spent time in all of these other places, was born as a Hebrew, probably had exposure to his own family at that point in time, so he knew some Hebrew, and the fact that he lived in, uh, in Egypt and he was part of the royal household, from time to time he had interaction with other Hebrews. So there was this constant back and forth between the Egyptian people and the Hebrew people, even though the Hebrews were slaves. Then from Egypt, he goes to Midian, and so he, he knows another language. So when you listen to Moses, there's a possibility that he had an accent. He had a Midianite accent, he had an Egyptian accent, he had a Hebrew accent, and so he's saying, I'm not sure that people will really be able to understand me. So Moses has this problem, and he sees it as a problem of speaking, and he's saying, I am an inadequate individual. But if you follow along with the reading, you'll notice that some things started to change. Moses says, I can't do this. And you'll notice in chapter 7 that they begin to change. They're actually doing what God asked them to do. I want you to notice, and I'll come back to this a little bit later on, but would you notice verse 6 of um, Exodus chapter 7? Verse uh, 6 says, Moses and Aaron did so. Five little words. Moses and Aaron did so. Meaning by that, they did what God asked them to do. Or drop down to verse 10. So Moses and Aaron went to Pharaoh and did just as the Lord commanded them. 
Wait, wait a minute, Moses. I thought you were afraid. I, I thought you weren't going to do it. I thought you were going to try to find someone else. So two times already we see that Moses and Aaron, they do exactly what God asked them to do. Or drop down to verse 20. Here's the same line again. Moses and Aaron did as the Lord commanded. Why in the world the change? What enabled them to do the very commands that God was given to them? And you'll also notice there in verse 7, there's this little phrase. Moses was 80 years old and Aaron 83 years old. Why does Moses even record that in this narrative? He's showing that they're no young chickens, as we say. They are older men. They are men that we might say, let's write them off. They don't have the ability to lead. But God is using them, and they're willing to do whatever God asks them to do. And the reason for that is they realize something about God. God is the Lord. And all of these events that are surrounding them at this point in time, they realize these are events that are coming from God. Inadequate? Maybe. Maybe. But here's something that Moses and Aaron learned, and you and I need to learn as well. There's this uh, dance, if we might call it, in which God asks them to do something. They take a small step of faith, and it's almost as if they step back and they watch God act. Sometimes that's what God is asking us to do. Just a little step of faith. I feel inadequate. I'm not sure I can do that have some fear within my bones, but there's this little step of faith. And then they step back and they watch God act to do the very things that he says he is going to do. Here's a principle that I hope you will take with you into the rest of your life. The principle is this, that God and God's great power is revealed through inadequate people who are willing to step out in faith. God's mighty works and God's mighty power is revealed through inadequate individuals who are willing to trust Him moment by moment. Now, as soon as you hear that, and I hope you'll ponder that over the course of this next week, here are three questions that I think we need to ask about that principle. First up, the question is, who is this principle for? Second question I want us to ask is, uh, okay, this principle is about obedience. Why in the world would I want to obey? Especially if, if God says he's going to do something, he's going to accomplish something. Why in the world would I want to obey? And then the third question is, what would it look like if you and I were actually obeying the Lord even though we feel as if we're inadequate? What would that look like? So three questions. Here's the first question. Who is this principle for? That is, that God reveals his great power through inadequate people who are willing to trust him moment by moment. Who's that principle for? Now, you might say it is for everyone. Let's just put on the brakes for a little bit. Certainly, this commandment was for Moses and Aaron. I'm here with you. I've given you a command. Uh, so this principle was for Moses and Aaron. And we also know that this principle was for the people of Israel because they were the ones who were going to be taken out of Egypt into the land that God promised them. God said he was going to do this. So this principle is for them, that God will use uh, uh, inadequate people. He'll demonstrate his great power for those who are going to step out in faith. And, and so Moses and Aaron become a model of that, an example of that. Um, one of the things that we see in Scripture is that God gives us revelation, sometimes as an example, so that we might do the same thing. I say that because in uh, Romans chapter 15, there is an interesting statement that is uh, recorded for us. Uh, Romans chapter 15 and verse 4. Here's what it says. For whatever was written in former days was written for our instruction, that through endurance and through the encouragement of the Scriptures, we might have hope. These things were written 
so that in our endurance, our step of faith, and through the encouragement of Scripture, we might have hope. We don't see everything fulfilled at this point, but we can trust God at this point in time. Now, I'm telling you that because not only was this principle for Moses and Aaron, but this principle was for the people of Israel, and this principle is for anyone who names the name of Jesus Christ and says, I'm following Him. He is my Lord. He is my King. This principle is for me. I've shared this passage with you as well. Uh, it's 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 16 and 17. And it relates to all passages of Scripture. Uh, Paul said to Timothy, all Scripture is breathed out by God, and it is profitable, and you remember how it goes from there, for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness, so that the man or woman of God might be complete, equipped for every good work. So the beginning of those two verses and the end of those two verses, I think, are extremely profound. All Scripture, not just a part of the Scripture, not just Paul's letters to us, not just the Gospels, but all Scripture, everything that we call Scripture, everything that the church has identified as Scripture, all Scripture is breathed out by God and it is for us so that we might be complete, complete in our knowledge, complete in our faith, and then prepared for everything that God wants us to do. So that means that Exodus chapter 7 is for us. God is speaking to us. This scripture is for us as well. Well, that leads to a um, second question. And the second question is that if this principle is true, and I think it is, then in light of that, why is it that we should obey the way Moses and Aaron obeyed? If we're to be people of faith as well, where God speaks through it, reveals his great power through inadequate people like us. Why should we do this? I want you to notice the progression in this passage in terms of what happens. You'll make note of the fact that uh, Moses and Aaron, after uh, Moses' protests, beginning in verse 1, they begin to move out and they begin to do certain things. Would you notice, however, when we get to... Um, this first miracle, this first sign, and it starts around about verse 8, where Moses and Aaron, they go up before the Pharaoh. And uh, Pharaoh is going to say, well, what is the evidence? What is the proof that, that God has sent you and wants you to, to let these people go? What, what is the proof? Would you notice in verse 10, uh, actually it's the end of verse um, 9, um, Moses says to Aaron, take your staff and cast it down before Pharaoh that it may become a serpent. So Moses and Aaron went to Pharaoh and did just as the Lord commanded them. Aaron cast down the staff before Pharaoh and his servants and it became a servant. Serpent, rather. And so you'll notice what, what happens at that point. Pharaoh, he calls for his music, uh, magicians and he basically says, okay, uh, do your thing as well. And they begin to throw down their staves as well. And they turn into snakes or turn into serpents, as the word is translated here. Now, what is significant about that is that we are told at the end of this uh, initial account that one of the things that takes place is that uh, the staff that Aaron threw down, it begins to swallow up all of the other serpents that are crawling around on the ground. The word that is translated serpent here is an interesting word, and it has some symbolism associated with it as well. It's actually the word that refers to an animal that is more than what Cecil B. DeMille might uh, translate as a, as a black snake or a rattlesnake or something like that. It's more the size of like a crocodile or a primordial uh, monster that comes up out of the waters. That's the kind of word that Moses is using at this point, not necessarily with the ones that uh, de describe the Egyptian ma uh, magicians. So what we see happening here is that God, even though there is this power that comes up against him, God's power is greater. And Moses and Aaron at 80 and 83 needed to understand that. Whatever God asked them to do, his power is greater than any other power that might come up against us. We might begin to think, I'm not, I'm not sure that's always true. But in terms of the scriptures, God's power is always greater. And Moses and Aaron are being encouraged by seeing this. There's a second sign that is given. 
Moses and Aaron are told that uh, they are to go out and they are to meet Pharaoh when he comes to the waters of the Nile. I wonder how they knew that Pharaoh was going to show up there because it was a very common thing in the Egyptian world. They would come, Pharaoh and the other Egyptians would come to the Nile because, uh, first of all, they, they thought that the Nile had healing properties associated to it. it. It was like a god to them, and they respected the Nile because of that. The Egyptians also instituted something else. They instituted regular bathing. They saw it as a good thing. Now, uh, parents, you might keep this in mind because uh, it could be that you might say some evening, you might say to one of the children, okay, time for your bath, go take your bath. And they begin to complain. And they might say something like, oh, why are you always making me take a bath? You can stop them right there and say, no, 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 me. Blame it on the Egyptians. They were the ones that started all of this. And so they did this regularly. They would come to the Nile on a regular basis because they saw it had healing properties. They, they, they saw it was something that they wanted to institute in their lifestyle, and they did that. And so they come, and, and Moses and Aaron show up, and they've already announced to Pharaoh what they're going to do. And Aaron takes his staff, and he touches the water. And instantaneously, it turns into blood. In fact, he waves his staff, and all of the waters in Egyptian, and lakes, and ponds, and other places, even uh, places where they're going to dig up the soil to find more water, it turns into blood. God's judgment has come upon them. Now notice this. God is sovereign over powers, even magical powers, demonic powers. But Pharaoh is learning, and Moses and Aaron are, are learning, that God is sovereign even over the natural world. God has control over all of those things. And one of the things that's happening is that Moses and Aaron, they're, they're beginning to grow in their faith. Because God's power is revealed through inadequate people who trust Him moment by moment. They step out in faith. They believe Him even sometimes when it's hard. It's the idea of, of this progressive thing. They're learning something more and more. Some of you today in this place have great faith. Didn't always start that way. But you have great faith because you, you, you started out and there were some difficulties in your life and, and, and somehow you said in your mind, okay, I'm going to take this step of faith. And you saw God provide. You saw God deliver. And that's happened over and over and over again and your faith increased along the way. I have four grandchildren, and um, the youngest one, little boy, his name is AJ. Uh, about three or four years ago, um, AJ, I guess he was around four or so, and uh, my son had decided that he was done with cutting his hair. Uh, the reason for that, because every time he tried to cut his hair, AJ would be squirming around, and it became more and more difficult. And, so my son said, uh, okay, AJ, uh, what we're going to do, we're going to start to go to a barber. And AJ, I don't want to go to a barber. I don't have to go to a barber. You can cut my hair. No, no AJ, we're going to go to a barber. And his name is Mr. Ryan. You're going to go to Mr. Ryan to get your hair cut. And he protested. He did not like the idea that he was going to go to a barber. And my son, in just, instead of commanding and saying, this is what you're going to do, uh, here's what he did. He said, well, AJ, let me tell you something. He said, are you aware of the fact that your best friend, Shepherd, goes to Mr. Ryan? Shepherd goes to Mr. Ryan? Yeah. Evidence piece number one. And then he said, are you aware of the fact that, AJ, when you go, one of the things that Mr. Ryan does is that after he cuts your hair, he has a little basket in there, little trinkets, little toys in there, and every little boy gets his hair cut. He can go over and he can pull out one of the trinkets. There are trinkets in that basket. There are toys in that basket. AJ, let me tell you something else. He said, do you know who else goes to Mr. Ryan? No, who? He said, Grandpa goes to Mr. Ryan. The deal was sealed at that point. <laughs> Shepherd goes there, toys there, Grandpa goes there. He had these pieces of information, of evidence before him, and he said, this is what I'm going to do. That's what God is doing in a much greater way with Moses and Aaron. Watch this, watch this, watch this. All they had to do was to step out in faith as inadequate people and to trust him. And God started to display his mighty power. So uh, who is this for? It's for people of faith that God calls to trust him. 
Why should they do it? Because God keeps showing himself piece by piece by piece that he is the mighty God, the Lord of the universe. There's a third question I said that we need an answer. And that third question, what would it look like? What would it look like today if after we say the amen and you walk out of this place and you said, listen, I, I don't think I'm a person of great faith, but, but I, I feel like God's telling me I should trust him. What would it look like? What would we be doing? Here are uh, three things I'd like to suggest to you that each one of us should be doing. Uh, those of us who say we, we are followers of the Lord Jesus Christ. Here's the first thing. A person of faith is a person who ought to embrace their identity. Let me add to that. They ought to embrace their identity in Jesus Christ. Moses and Aaron had a change in their identity. If you don't believe that, just go back to chapter 7 and verse 1. And the Lord said to Moses, See, I have made you like God to Pharaoh, and your brother Aaron shall be your prophet. Please notice that God did not make Moses God. He said, You will be like God. Moses was the real spokesperson for the living God. God was telling him what to do. He translated that uh, to Aaron, and Aaron is the one who begins to speak. So Moses is becoming like God. He's demonstrating different things that God wants the people of Egypt and the people of Israel to know. So he has this identity, this is who I am. And Aaron begins to say, wait a minute, I'm, I'm just not your normal everyday Israelite. I am going to be God's prophet, Moses' prophet along the way. There is a change of identity uh, that begins to take place in their lives. And it begins to carry them through all of these plagues, through the deliverance actually out of, out of Egypt. So what that means for us is that we need to understand who are we really. We need to understand our identity. Now here's the great thing about salvation history and salvation theology. Much of salvation theology in the New Testament has to do with our identity. I have a... Um, friend, and his name is Dale, and uh, Dale, uh, if he's asked, uh, who are you? Dale will say this. He's been saying this for years. Um, he said, I am a disciple of Jesus Christ who is cleverly dis disguised as a high school teacher. That, that's his career. That's his profession, a teacher. It, he says, Dale, who are you? I am a disciple of Jesus Christ who is cleverly disguised as a teacher, cleverly disguised as something else. Now, there's more to that than just being a disciple, a follower of Jesus. You're something else. All of the righteousness of Jesus is upon you. It's in you. When God looks upon you, your identity is not someone who has committed these terrible sins, someone who's a horrible. You have the righteousness of Jesus Christ. You have the Spirit of God who lives within you to empower you to do everything that God wants you to do. And we could go on and on and on to talk about all of the attributes of your identity in Jesus Christ. So if you are going to be an inadequate person who becomes very adequate, displaying the power of God to people around you, one of the first things you have to do, you have to embrace your true identity. You are identified with the person and work of the Lord Jesus Christ. So the second thing that you and I need to think about doing and that is we also need to embrace the timing of God. I want you to notice that something has been taking place. God told Moses, this is what's going to happen. You're going to come up to, to Pharaoh. You're going to say certain things, and he's going to resist. He's going to resist again. He's going to resist again. He's going to resist over and over and over again. Would you notice that after... Um, God says to Moses, this is what I want you to do. You, you'll come to verse 13 of chapter 7. And it says, Still Pharaoh's heart was hardened, and he would not listen to them as the Lord had said. The Lord said this is what's going to take place. I don't know about you, but there would be a temptation for me at this point in time saying, I'm not going to go any farther. If he's not going to change, he's never going to change. But they didn't stop there. In fact, he presents the, the second sign, the second miracle. And would you look at verse 23? 
after the Nile has been turned to blood, all of the water bodies there in Egypt have turned to blood, notice what Pharaoh does. The audacity of this man, where it says, Pharaoh turned and went into his house, and he did not take even this to heart. The last verse, verse 25, says, Seven full days passed after the Lord had struck the Nile. So there's a week that has gone by, and yet Moses and Aaron continue because they're trusting the timing of God. God wants you to trust Him even when it seems sometimes like it's been a long time in which you've been praying over and over and over again for something to happen. Even though you have a long stretch of time does not mean that God has given up or God has ignored you. Because you see, God is, is working through our lives to take us right into eternity. That's His goal for us. And for some, that happens over a short period of time. Some, it happens over a long period of time. But God wants us to trust Him and His timing. Any athletic contest has a clock. <laughs> and one of the things that the players do, they, they will watch the clock. But here's something that they cannot do. Even though they look at the clock to see how much more time they have, uh, when can they take a shot, when can they throw a pass, when can they do it, they, they look at the clock and what they cannot do, they cannot make that clock go faster. They can slow down what they're going to do in terms of play, but they cannot slow down the clock. Something else has sovereignty over that clock. God has sovereignty over the timing of our lives, and it's our responsibility to trust Him. You won't want to forget that God's power is revealed through inadequate people who trust Him moment by moment. So, um, one of the things we must do, we must embrace our identity, specifically our identity in Christ. We need to embrace God's timing for all things. But one other thing we need to do, and that is we need to embrace the obedience of God's commandments even though no one else does so. I'm sure it doesn't record in this chapter, but I'm sure that there were people in Israel, this did happen with the elders, remember, in, in uh, chapter 5, chapter 6, where they basically got angry at, at Moses and Aaron. And I'm sure there were people who advised them and said, uh, listen, uh, let's just give up on it. Let, let's just quit. Let, let's make life uh, a little more comfortable for us. But they didn't do that. They embraced the commandments of God even when other people did not do that. That was manifested in our Lord Jesus Christ as well, who went to the cross even when other people turned away from Him. And that's what the Spirit of God is asking us to do. There may be people around you who do not obey God, do not obey God's standards, do not obey God's uh, system of righteousness, but the call upon us is to be faithful, moment by moment by moment. I'm sure you've already figured out that uh, in this passage, Moses and Aaron really didn't do very much. Oh, you're, well, what? They had the courage to stand before, yes, they, they did. But they really didn't do very much to bring all of these different things to pass. God said, this is what I want you to do. They stepped out by faith. And it was God who turned a staff into a snake or a serpent. And it was God, even though they reached out and they touched the body of the Nile, it was God who turned it into blood. God is always the one who is working. He's working in your life. He's working around your life. And God may say things like, you know what I want you to do? I, I, I want you to um, forgive this person who has offended you. And you might say, oh, I'm not sure I can do that. But God's working all around you. His Spirit is living within you if you are a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ, and He's giving you the power to do what He wants you to do. Step out in faith and watch God work. He may say to us, listen, I, I think you need to be a little more generous. God's been generous to you. Why aren't you generous to others? Well, I, you know, we need to save for a rainy day. 
And God says, step out by faith. Be generous because that's what I want you to and, and watch me work. Watch him work this week as uh, you pray for people that you love very much. Maybe you're not walking with the Lord. And keep praying again and again and again and, and watch God work. He will. And watch God work in this body to accomplish the things that he has entrusted to you. And then watch him work. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. Thank you for your kindness and your mercy to us. For, Father, we're going to be honest this morning and say that we feel very inadequate. We feel very inadequate to talk about the gospel to others. We feel very inadequate when it comes to teaching others, teaching our children. We feel very inadequate when you ask us to do certain things that are important to the cause of Christ. But we're going to trust you. And we're going to trust you to do your good work in and through us as we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.